How about that? Did you turn the mic off before you handed it to me? I literally touched nothing. Konnichiwa. It's good to see everybody. Uh, as I was saying, I've been friends with Dave for 20 years, almost, um, before either of us were really doing venture capital. Uh, I want to also applaud Dave because he really was the earliest champion. Hey, Eric. He was the earliest champion of international investing, international markets, highlighting the innovation happening all over the world. And the reason that spoke to me so much is I actually lived internationally for 11 years, including in Japan in 1999. So what I want to talk about today is venture capital for the next decade. What do I believe will happen? So first of all, why should venture exist? I guess in this group, it shouldn't go without saying that it should exist, but let's justify it a little bit. What I have on this chart is global demographics excluding the United States. And what you see on the right-hand side is men on the women, on the left-hand side is women. And what you see towards the top, the further up the top is the older the band of people who were born in that time frame, and the bottom is the younger people. And this illustrates very clearly that we have a dem demographic problem if we want to keep GDP increasing and increase resources for everybody in the world. We need productivity gains. If you include the United States, the United States is a little bit different, but not so different. We have a flattening demographic trend that's reversing the last 100 plus years of demographic growth. And so I start with one statement, which is, again, this is just the United States, but the trends are pretty similar in many places. In the United States, we have 3.8% unemployment. That's what economists call full employment. It's a problem, and that problem manifests itself in increasing wages and inflation. There's only one of the reasons you see inflation today. But without more workers... If we want to keep GDP growing, that necessitates robotics. It necessitates AI. It necessitates automation. This is justification number one. Justification number two, I wrote this slide about a year ago for my own LPs, but never is it more true than this week. The world is deglobalizing. World War II, post-World War II uh, defense structures structures of how countries resolve differences, that those norms are reversing. And that is leading to pressure on technologies like cybersecurity, national defense, the need to increase agricultural production. If you just look at Ukraine, taking Ukraine grain out of the world, you may not feel in Japan, we may not feel in the United States, but believe me, many places around the world are gonna notice not just less wheat, but with less petroleum, it means less fertilizer. With less fertilizer, it means growing less crops. Growing less crops means more people die. This is the world that we face. I think obvious that climate change is a major problem that the world is trying to address in my neighborhood in Los Angeles. That manifests itself as regular fires. So we've been looking at and investing in technology that can actually reduce the spread of fires. Uh, obviously, many companies now are looking at carbon reduction as a way of changing climate change. Uh, also, this deglobalization and goal of reducing carbon footprints is creating more regional supply chains. So all of these solutions are needed to protect assets and to protect people. This isn't probably what you're used to when people are talking about technology. But if you're going to invest in technology, you really need to understand the macro trends that are driving your technology. We seem to exist in a little bubble where we read our own articles, we talk about our own technologies, we think that what we do is the only important stuff. 
And in reality, we are in service of something much bigger. National budgets are under pressure across the world. We've had for too long people using debt to finance governments. We have not just declining birth rates, but people living longer, so aging population. And I mentioned the obvious, which is technology must be a solution for providing healthcare going forward. Aging population, and that also means a reduction of number of medical professionals everywhere. So with that as the backdrop, I wanna talk a little bit about venture capital, I want to talk about where we as Upfront Ventures, my fund is focused and how those macro trends affect us. So to be good at venture capital, you really need to do three things right. And they sound relatively easy, but they're actually quite hard. The first is you actually shouldn't have to be said, but you kind of need to know something about technology. And we do get many people who are enter our industry that actually don't. Fundamentally, if you start to grow a business and you want that business to have more than linear scale and to protect itself from competition, technology must be at the heart of defensibility. We simply won't fund companies that don't at their core have technology as the most defensible part of what they do. So you have to know something about tech, but that's not enough. You also need to understand the timing of technology. If you invest in a trend that is coming in 10 years, you're not going to do well as a venture capitalist. There's an old saying in technology, which is that being too early is the same as being wrong. Being too early is the same as being wrong. If you piled your money into this thing called AR and VR in 2017, you lost a metric shit ton of money. And a lot of people were doing that. The trend is right. The timing was wrong. If you are investing in what you're reading about in the media today and you're starting today, you missed it. Move on to the next thing. How many people were sitting at a poker table at one in the morning and people shouted crypto and they said, I'm all in. How did that work out for 2020? If you were investing in 2013, 14, 15, like Fred Wilson and Chris Dixon and a lot of the people who were betting on the trend and the trend might have been right, it might have been wrong, but they made a lot of money. Pushing in your chips on today's technology is a recipe for losing money. And here's the really big kicker. You can be right about the trend. You can be right about the timing. But venture capital is a winner take most business. And if you bet on the wrong team, you also lose. I bet on a text messaging platform. I lived in Europe. I saw text messaging emerging. I lived in Japan in 1999. I watched devices as small as this at NTT, NTT Docomo and people like doing this. And then I go back to the US and nobody's sending text messaging. I said, this is it. This is the next big trend. The problem is, and I, and I invested in a very fast growing business. The problem is um, it wasn't called WhatsApp. So venture capitalists, I like to say that our industry operates like children on a soccer field. Everybody chases the ball. Nobody stays in position. So right now, everybody's investing in what? Just tell me. Generative AI. Can't just be AI. What the? Can someone tell me what that says or should I get on my phone? And Okay. Yeah. Generative AI is okay. Um, the majority of money is made by staying in position. Ignore the people telling you to join the latest trend. It is really hard to be a VC because you need to raise money from LPs. And LPs read papers too. And they tell you, how many generative AI companies do you have? How many unicorn companies do you have? How many crypto? And it's really hard to bet against that trend. So we have just finished the longest bull market in the technology history, 13 unabated years. 
And what that means is two things. One is people all, like who entered the market in the last 13 years have learned that things just go up and to the right. In order to have seen one major correction, the GFC, the global financial crisis, in order to have seen one, you have to be in your 40s. In order to have seen the dot-com bust and the GFC, you have to be in your 50s. And I'm not saying that old guys rule, but I'm not not saying that. It's very clear to me to be in a VC fund, you need young people because the young people who work in my office, they know the next technology trends. They're in all the wedding parties. They're going to birthday parties in Dubai. They're with the people creating companies, but that mixture between experience to not chase trends and youth and energy and vision, that's a really important mix. Seed stages got a little bit crazy. Uh, we had a 100x increase since people like Dave McClure pioneered this category. What is even crazier is how much money was given to the largest venture capital funds. And by the way, I'm happy to publish these slides. You know, I'll send them to Dave uh, if you don't want to take pictures, um, but you're also welcome. They look much nicer because I'm in front of them. No. Uh, so uh, these are the 10 biggest venture funds in the United States. They raised in the last four years four times more than they raised in the prior three years per year. They raised four and a half billion dollars per year more than the prior three years. What problem did that create? It drove up valuations to unsustainable levels because you had an increase in supply and not an increase in amazing outcomes. And ultimately, it created this trend. Okay, so this is plotting so-called unicorns. I'd like you to look at the left side of that chart. Uh, it starts in 2012. There was an article written in 2013 by Aileen Lee. There were three companies in that year. This is, cum this is um, new per year, not cumulative number of unicorns. And in 2013, looking one bar chart to the left, she said, there's not many billion dollar outcomes. They're unicorns. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, we started creating all of these companies valued at a billion dollars, not worth, but valued. And it culminated in 2021 with 723 of them. But I would ask you to look at this chart. This is the number of public companies in the United States worth a billion dollars or more, publicly traded. There are exactly 343 of them. That's it. And yet we created 723 in one year. There are 1,400 approximately private billion dollar valued companies of which I predict 1,100 will never be worth a billion dollars when they exit. So finally, the public markets did what they do. They reverted to the mean. Valuation multiples declined. If you look at the top, these are four different markets. 24.6, what does that mean? That means that November 9th, 2021, public markets were paying 24.6 times next year's revenue. Guess what the 20-year average is? So it's 24.6 was the peak, 6.2. That's public markets. Private markets were even crazier. So this is private markets, Series C and Series D. In 2022, we started the year 500 million posts. We ended the year at 187 posts as the median valuation. So valuations have started to correct. But there are 5,000 seed A and B companies created per year in the last four years. Those 20,000 companies are running into a phenomenon called a brick wall. There just is not that much financing for them. So some VCs seeing this overvaluation will simply wait for the next cohort of startups to come along, which is why it's a great time to be starting a company because those companies don't have all the problems that came before. So what are three strategies we're pursuing it up front? And i sorry for going fast. I just don't want to overrun for Dave. Uh, we try to be a few years ahead of where we think most of the market is. And starting from the top to the bottom are some trends we started investing in. 
So in 2017, we started investing more in healthcare and biology. It was really a recognition that this thing called AI is real. And it's not that we don't believe it. We have, I don't know, eight or 10 AI companies, all of which are now suddenly getting increasingly value, valued by people. Um, we just think that AI, it's like um, a decade ago when people were creating mobile funds. Of course, mobile is everything. AI is everything. Can you imagine going to a doctor in 10 years from now and them not consulting AI models to look at your data? Can you imagine people trying to fix your car with not addressing it? You know, what, whatever you're thinking about the future, talking to a customer service rep where they're not using AI or chatbots to talk with you. So increasingly now, though, our biggest theme is space and national defense. So I want to talk about these two areas first. Uh, one is healthcare. And what you see on this slide is the shortage of physicians in the United States, tens of thousands of unfilled jobs because we simply don't have the training or the people or the demographics. And we have decided that we no longer believe in immigration. We can't go to the Philippines. We can't go to Nigeria. We can't ask more people to move from Mexico to try and fill this problem. It's not going to happen. Politics won't allow it. And this is true globally. But to be a good investor, I also believe you need edge. You need to be good at something that other people aren't, not just the trend, but you need something else. At Upfront, our something else is Los Angeles. So we invest about 40% of our dollars in LA, less than half. We're not regional, but that serves as edge. So if you look at healthcare, this is the number of top life sciences jobs and top 100 hospitals in the country based in Los Angeles. It is the leading market in the United States for healthcare. If you look at defense, this is the expenditures on space. The left-hand part of the chart, it's about a half a trillion dollars expenditure today expected to grow by 3x. But what you might find interesting about space is if you look at the right-hand side, 77% of that entire economy is commercial, not governmental. So government's important, but people assume that space is only government. It's actually quite an incredible commercial opportunity. So let me make this argument for why Dave McClure was successful. I, I would argue he's partially charming. But on the left-hand side, this drove his success is AWS. Because AWS drove down the costs of compute, of launching a startup by 90% between 2000 and 2005, and another 90% by 2010. That allowed 500 startups to be funded because you could hand people $500,000 instead of 5 million. And you saw a Cambrian explosion of startup companies. The same thing is happening in space. On the right-hand side is the cost per kilogram to launch into space. It's already come down by 90%. Why? SpaceX. Because of Falcon 9, you can take the base of the rocket, launch it into space, and reland it. And as a result, the cost of relaunching and relaunching and relaunching has gone down tremendously. SpaceX has a near monopoly today, but there are other companies like Stoke and uh, other companies now who are forming to try and compete. Eventually, I think some will catch them. But even if it's just SpaceX, the cost has come down tremendously, which is why in Los Angeles, there are 91 startups that have spun out of SpaceX. So Elon decided to move to Texas. Texas has no taxes, state taxes. Um, that may have been a decision, part of his decision, but there's a lot of people who didn't want to go. So this is part now of the important economy of Los Angeles. So if you look at it, 40% now of all funding into aerospace, defense and space startups now is in Southern California. Last point, we are also focused on secondary markets. And I wanted to make this small plug because that's Dave's focus, but it also is a major focus for us. So on the right-hand side, you see our last round valuation of a mythical company, call it any company. If you move a little bit to the left, you will see the value today. It's about 20% down. What does this mean? Let me just explain it for a second. 
When venture capitalists invested in a company, let's say they set the value at a billion dollars, right now on their books, they've probably marked it down to 850 or 800 because they look at the public markets, the public markets are down and so they mark it down. So this is the nominal valuation that a venture capital fund holds it on their books. All the way on the left is something called the 409A valuation. In the United States, that's the price at which employees buy their stock options if they execute. So employees aren't going to sell you stock cheaper than they have to pay, but they are willing to sell it for something cheaper than the venture capitalists are holding preferred stock. So why do we think this is a really interesting opportunity? Well, angel and seed funds need liquidity. Number two is the liquidity that they thought was right around the corner in 2021 suddenly has been pushed out to 2025. Now, they don't want to sell everything, but if they could sell 20%, 25% and be 75% long, they could return money to investors and then go out and, and use that as a way to encourage people to invest in their next fund. So this is happening everywhere now. Third point, management teams. Let's say you've been at a company for eight years, 10 years. Let's say that you have three kids in high school. You're starting to think about how you're going to send them to college. You've been telling your husband, you've been telling your wife, don't worry, I know I don't make as much as I should be making, but we're about to get all this money in stock options. And then suddenly you say, maybe by the time they're done with college. If you could sell 20% today and fund their college education or buy a house, or take the pressure off the home front, would you sell 20%? My conversations say yes. And finally, LPs have a problem. And this is called the denominator problem because they have too much as a percentage of the pie allocated to venture capital right now. And they need to get that down, which is forcing people to start considering selling part of their positions early to generate liquidity. I think it's one of the best trades in venture capital right now. That's... Uh, it on why we are long on the technology markets. We think it's important for society. We are equally long. I want to close this on the US-Japanese alliance. Why? Because decoupling China from the US, which is going to happen whether we like it or not, I don't think it's good for the world, but it is what's happening. I think we'll put more pressure on the US-Japanese, US-Korean, US-Taiwanese relationship. We have so much vested interest in getting the combined cross-border opportunities working. It works with Israel in the United States. It's a tiny country, seven-ish million people, 120 million people in Japan. It should be 10 to 20 times the opportunity. Thank you. Check, check. Uh, thanks, Mark. That was also a great plug for the countries which we've just been visiting, which included Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of time to maybe cover a few things that were in your slides. Um, I guess I, I'm happy that you highlighted uh, healthcare and space as two big areas of investment. But selfishly, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the secondary opportunity that you uh, were highlighting there. Um, I guess maybe a big picture story. What's new and different about secondaries or or is there anything new and different and why is now maybe an interesting time so secondaries have always existed it's always been a very big market but secondaries historically have focused on uh, buyout funds or private equity it was always seen that if you were in venture capital you shouldn't sell early and it really never made sense to me like I don't, if you get into an interesting company, I don't think that means that you need to sell everything. But again, I just want to use a poker analogy or a blackjack or whatever. I guess it's more poker, let's say. You know, if you're sitting at a table and you suddenly find that you've got this massive pile of winnings in front of you, why not take 20% off and put it in your pocket to make sure that if you start to lose some money, you at least are going to go home with gains. And venture capitalists never thought about that. But keep this in mind is... 10 years ago, the average great company at a venture capital firm IPO'd within six to eight years. Today, even excluding the fact that the IPO window has gone away, it was more like 12 to 13 years. So just doubling the time to get liquidity creates a huge problem for limited partners, which is lack of liquidity. 
And yet we have uh, founders who regularly sell a little bit of their stake at year three, four, and five. Why do founders sell? One of the reasons founders sell is they're like, hey, I want to de-risk and take some cash off the table while still remaining long. And then we have aligned incentives and I can focus. And you know, frankly, then my husband, wife, partner, whatever, isn't going to bug me as much. But it's the same as it's the same exact trade. So I think the lack of DPI is starting to become something that LPs are aware of and therefore VCs are aware of. And I just want to say this real quickly, Dave, in defense of secondary and why I think it's so interesting is um, if you look at the 20-year average in venture capital, DPI, distributions per invested capital. Cash back to LPs. Cash back to LPs uh, for top quartile funds is two and a half to three times a fund, 2.5 to 3x. That's uh, top quartile. You have a number of early stage funds holding their funds at 7.8x TVPI, which is paper gain, not cash gain, with no DPI. And uh, this 7.8x uh, realization, uh, I'm sorry, uh, holding value is going to collapse. But that's exactly what happened in the last two market corrections. And uh, again, I think this need for cash distributions for LPs and for VCs is driving people to reconsider early exits. Yeah, and I'll, I'll reflect just personally when you were talking up there about selling 20% and paying for a house and paying for college. That that was exactly my scenario. <laughs> uh, three years ago, I, I had some pretty significant paper gains from uh, Carrie and our first two funds at 500 Startups and decided to take some money off the table, uh, was able to buy a house in Los Altos, uh, California, which was not cheap, put some money into our new firm and put some money away for college for the kids. Uh, at the time, I was worried, you know, I, I sold it a Effectively, about a thirty percent discount to NAV, and that that was in a good market <laughs> three years ago. And I thought, geez, you know, I, I I'm selling, you know, something that probably is going to like end up making two to three x for the people that bought it for me. But the portion that I'm not selling, if that happens, will be quite considerable. And heaven forbid, if something happens negatively in the market, at least I'll have taken some money off the table. And I I think that math is probably a lot more present <laughs> now for people in a tough market. And obviously prices have come down a little bit. Um, I think one other uh, note I would bring up is you and I had a conversation last summer uh, about the secondary topic. And I think we were both surprised to hear that we were each thinking about that. <laughs> it wasn't really on very many people's radar at the time. Um, and in fact, everybody was still kind of recovering from the market collapse, but uh, it seems like there's a pretty big opportunity now. So one thing I would point out is when you invest in venture capital fund, which I think is a good idea, uh, since for I raised the, for money, the top quartile yeah. funds, which we both are. Well, I just top I, I just meant good idea because why would I say it's a bad idea since I raised money? Um, but um, but it is what's called a blind pool, meaning you give us money and you have absolutely no idea what we're going to do with it. And we have a track record that says for every 40 investments we do, we do about 40 investments per fund, six of them drive 80% of returns. So you really, it, you know, it operates as, you know, something called the power law. But with secondary, if you invest in secondary, you actually know the underlying assets you're investing in and you're buying them at a discount. So I sold, um, so we sell we exit about 80 to $100 million a year consistently for the last, call it 20 years. Most of our funds are small, between two to 300 million. So, you know, we're regularly ringing the cash register. In 2021 alone, we exited almost $600 million in one year. Why? Because the markets were crazy. Um, and so we sold 165 in one secondary transaction at a 16.8% discount to my holding. Today, if you're a buyer, the minimum discount is 40%. That that would be minimum. And I think we're typically seeing 50 to 70% in a lot of scenarios. So it's a good buying opportunity if you can find supply. Yeah. And I, I think your your other comment before about, you know, historically private equity and buyout has kind of been where the secondary market's been more active. That maybe started 20, 25 years ago. I think it's $150 billion in traded secondary in the private equity market. Uh, comparatively on venture, you know, st stats are a little fuzzy, but probably closer to maybe only $50 billion right now. 
Most of that is actually direct secondary in companies. Hardly any of that, at least to date, has been in funds. Uh, any comments on what you think about like direct versus uh, portfolio secondary? I think they're both interesting opportunities. Uh, venture capitalists need to be educated, and they need to be educated that this exists. And why is it a good thing to do? The good news is I think LPs are starting to educate them, saying, we're not writing a check unless you send us cash. Uh, and it's hard to generate cash because you can't go to your CEOs and say, sell your company, please. Um, and so one way that they can do it is by selling part of their funds. So I think it's naturally going to happen, but I'm out for educating the market. We've talked a lot about why we did it in 2021. There are some complexities. Um, if you do a lot of secondary in the United States, at least, you have to be registered with the SEC. It's not a terrible thing to be registered with the SEC, but we are registered with the SEC, both because we were a seller, a large seller and a large buyer of secondary markets. I think in the US, it's somewhere between 110, 150 million under management that you have to become. I don't remember the, the bright line test, but I know that if you're doing it substantively, you have to be registered. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot more of it. Now, for me personally, as a VC, like if I was in your position, I think, what an amazing thing to buy out a bunch of VC managers, both because you can buy 15 or 20 companies at once or more, but also imagine you look at 200 VC funds and you only do five. Well, you have all the data now on all the underlying portfolio companies. It's the best information arbitrage trade deal I could think of. Uh, and, uh, and uh, but I don't suggest doing it. Uh, but uh, but on top of that, um, you know, I think it's it's a great way to build diversity in the portfolio of comp diversity of companies. Now, for me as a venture capitalist, I don't have the time to do that. What I'm doing is targeting companies I already know and individual shareholders that I know need liquidity. And uh, the first trade I'm trying to do, I told you last night, um, I've generated. Um, about $75 million of interest across three companies that I'm targeting of people who want to sell. And then I've talked to a couple of very large funds that want to do secondary, and I'm trying to create a vehicle to broker that transaction. You know, I, I have a million more questions I'd love to ask you where we're running a little bit behind on our talk today, but thanks again for coming in, talking about, uh, you know, what you're heading uh, towards in the next few years. And I think also highlighting the Japan-US alliance. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me.